right, we're going to go straight live to the interview you have all been waiting for. Money, power, and influence inside the trinity of an enigmatic businessman. All questions on the table as Linus Kaikai unveils businessman come politician Jimmy Wanjigi. We take you to his residence at Muthaiga. Linus. Thank you, thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Jeff. We're live from Muthaiga, the home of businessman Jimmy Wanjigi, where in October 2017, for three days, police laid siege right here in this home uh, where the businessman and his family lives. And until that day, very few Kenyans had placed the face to the name Jimmy Wanjigi. And this, in his first interview with, with television, Jimmy Wanjigi is talking to us right here on Sunday Live. And Jimmy, thank you for talking to Citizen TV and welcome to this thank show. You. Thank you, thank you, Linus, and welcome to our home. Once thank again. you. Thank you. Very and in 2017, the incident I'm referring to, until that time, very few Kenyans knew who Jimmy Wanjigi uh, was. And on the 25th of June, 2017, the Nation newspaper, Daily Nation, introduced you as follows. Mr. Jimmy Wanjigi has grown in 15 years of shady deals from an ordinary hustler to a continental oligarch with a flat in London's Parkland, a massive mansion on five acres on Muthaiga Road, where we are just now, just yards away from the US ambassador residence, homes in Zurich and bolt holes in Dubai. <laughs> Is that Jimmy? <laughs> Let me tell you, Jimmy is a humble family man, simple family man, a husband and a father of two lovely, lovely children. I am a Catholic. That is my faith. I grew up quite well. I have parents and siblings still very much here with us. I'm trained in business and economics, and I'm currently uh, doing a bit more because you know you must sharpen yourself to the world. So I'm taking more training in international relations and diplomacy because the world is about that. But Jimmy is also introduced in the very few articles that are out there about you as the closest Kenya has ever gotten to Russian-like oligarch people who control who becomes president, what government contracts go to, goes to who. That is the Jimmy that has also been introduced elsewhere. Well, I think you better ask the nation where they got that story. Because uh, I wouldn't accept the belief that uh, they are oligarchs in Kenya. Kenya has businessmen. I'm a businessman. And I'm a strong businessman a legitimate businessman, one that follows the rule of law, and one that chases business far and wide, even beyond the borders of this country. But also a businessman who admits and says he was behind the formation of the Jubilee Coalition in 2013, and he was behind the presidential candidate of NASA in 2017. That is not just an ordinary businessman. Oh, why not? Businessmen are about solving problems. We find solutions to problems. We had a very big problem post-2007. Very big problem in this country. We had never seen the kind of violence perpetuated on our populace because of an election. I was invited to find a solution to a unification of two warring communities that were plagued at the time by ICC. Business is about solving problems. I was solving problems. I was bringing unification. Because also business does not thrive when there's no peace. So I unified two parties. I helped unify. I was not alone. I helped unify two parties. 
And I think we successfully did that. Now, peacemakers unify and then leave the stage. If it's true you unified in 2013 and President Uhuru Kenyatta and Deputy President William Ruto got together, they went into government and thereafter you are associated with a number of government deals. There is talk of the SGR itself. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me put it this way. I did leave the stage, but I left the stage away from my two good friends because of policy, a difference of policy, a big difference of policy. SGR was a project birthed by me in 2008 with the same company called China Road and Bridge. We birthed it. We spent a lot of money doing what you call feasibility studies and technical studies. And I want to tell you something. The intention when we began was that rail was going to be a private rail. Nothing to do with government. Nothing to do with government. In fact, government was just supposed to provide the land which we were prepared to lease. It was like a real estate project. At the time, River Valley Rail had a concession of 22 years. And it wasn't doing well. Cargo had reduced from when it took over from something like 25% to 4%. So we were saying, let's change the game. What I recall of the project cost was something like 55 billion. And it was private. And that was 55 billion from Mombasa all the way to Kisumu, in fact, Malaba. That is what I recall. So what we wanted to do was straighten up the line, okay? And because we know who carries cargo, they are not more than six or seven products. Get them to invest in the wagons, rolling stock, and pay us real estate value. That was the intention of the standard SGR that and, I started. And that was in 2008? Yes. A and you said that um, after 2013, you, didn't, you left the stage? After 2013, it came to my attention. At that time, it became a project that was now not worth 55 billion between Mombasa and Malaba, but 300 plus billion just from Mombasa to Nairobi. And I said, this does not make sense to me. If this is what, if this, this does not make sense. And this is where maybe on policy we differed, if that is the difference. So you but differed on money? No. It's, it's not the peace no, no, you're no. talking about? It, it is on policy. It not only became about money, it became about government doing it. The intention was never to take any taxpayer's money right. for this project. Right. And when we come back from the break, we will discuss a bit more on the SGR and many, many other issues about the life and times of Jimmy Wanjigi, businessman turned politician. We will be joining you shortly after this. Coming up, money, influence, and power. We unveil politician come businessman Jimmy Wanjigi. I'm Omeza, you stand by. Thank you and welcome back. Before we took the break, Jimmy, we were talking about the SGR project. And if I heard you right, you said at concept stage, it was supposed to be worth 55 billion. Correct. And get it right, 55 billion from Mombasa to Malaba. What happened is that it became 300 billion between Mombasa and Nairobi. And it became a government project. 
my intention and the intention of China Road and Bridge at the time was that we were going to do a private PPP. It was a PPP project. Public, public, private partnership. partnership. That is what it was supposed to be. Now, I, of course, could not agree with such a policy. And I voiced my concern. I said, in fact, instead of doing just the rail from Mombasa to Nairobi, why don't you take that money? Because the Chinese had given the money. Why don't you reallocate it to roads? Why don't we do an eight-lane highway so hold from on. Mombasa to Malaba? Now hold on a moment, uh, uh, Jimmy, because someone listening to you would think you're the nice guy who just wanted the railway constructed. But you brought about, and you stated that, that you brought together Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, William Ruto as a ticket. Mm. Obviously, there was a reason you wanted to uh, do that. And in the estimation of many Kenyans, you wanted to make money. <laughs> I'm a businessman. Of course I wanted to make money. But you can't make money when you don't have peace. When you don't have peace. The fact that you had warring parties in this country meant that you don't have peace. I was a unifier of peace. That peace was achieved. And from that, you can do business, any business. You've seen it time and time again. I think it's more used to say, si asambaya, maishambaya. So that is why. So I brought peace. But you also wanted to be the lead business person in this PPP on the construction of the railway. And Jubilee came to office with other plans. Jubilee came to office on SGR to use public money. I, as a businessman, wanted to use private money. I did not ask to take taxpayers' money. So I think you can see the difference. Debt, which you have today, of that railway is phenomenal. This was extended further from Siokimau to a place called Dukamoja. Dukamoja, beyond Maimahio, for another 185 billion. That's public money. I don't think there's a rail that traveled on that rail between Siokimau and Dukamoja yeah, let, let, more than two weeks. Yeah. Let's set aside the public money for a moment and talk about your money. Yes. And uh, you spoke about conceptualizing the SGR in 2008. Mm. I want to take you further back to the administration of President Mwai Kibaki. And all the articles, the information that emerges out there was that you were to the go-to uh, wheeler dealer in, 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 in the description of others in the security-related projects and other sensitive projects that the government had to do. And I want us to talk about anglo leasing and your role. What about my role in anglo leasing? What was your role in anglo leasing? I had no role. I had no role in anglo leasing. I had no role. I think the subsequent investigations into anglo leasing have come to vindicate me. There's a part of Anglo leasing from what I've read in literature that was paid after all the hula baloo out of court battles outside this country. Contracts that were legitimate, they had to be paid. And they were paid. You see, and the ones that were not legitimate, let me finish, uh, Linus, the ones that were not legitimate. I think there are still matters in court, and you don't see Jimmy in court. The agents of those anglo leasings are in court. They're having their day in court. We shall see. Talk to us about Tile Company, T-Y-L, a company associated with you, whose name appears in government projects such as security projects. No, that is not correct. That is not correct. TYL Limited 
is a company domiciled in Dubai. And it has never done any business with the Kenyan government at all. Whatever you have seen is literally fabrication. Nothing to do. I have never done business directly with government. That is not accurate. It, uh, directly, no. If you say that, Jimmy, then what have you been doing within government circles, especially from the era of Mwai Kibaki until 2017 when you parted ways with Jubilee? Because you were very close associate of former, the late uh, Minister for Interior, George Saitoti. George Saitoti was a very good friend. We never did business together. He was a very good long-term friend, like many others. But Linus, I think it's important you understand my story just a bit more. My first business, my first business was garbage collection. I pioneered garbage collection in this country, private garbage collection. There was a time during the Moi administration that garbage in this city, when you had a city commission headed by Fred Gomo, was a nightmare. Everywhere you went, garbage was not being collected. And the bylaws said that the garbage must be collected by the city once it's put in the receptacle. I got permission, after a lot of lobbying, to assist a complimentary service that I will provide plastic bags under a company called Bins Limited. And those plastic bags I would not put in the receptacle. I needed permission to dump the garbage in Dondora, their site. Let me tell you, I began that business without a penny. Without a penny. But I told you, business is about solving problems, finding solutions. I had the privilege. But what you're not telling me, Jimmy, is also why all these contacts yes. in government, why the interest in who becomes president. You are a key figure in the Kibaki administration mm. in the construction of the thicker highway, weren't you involved? Yes, that I was involved. Not directly. I was an agent of companies that participated in Thicker Road. That I was. That I accept. And that was a game-changing project. I even raised the money because ADB funded about 22 billion. It was a shortfall of about 10, which we managed to raise from China. But I'll go further. I was also instrumental in the Kibaki era because you want to understand where I come from. In 2003, when the president was going to China, I had a lot of Chinese government friends. And one of the things they were offering as a gift to the Kenyan people through the new president was a stadium, was a stadium. I went and pleaded and I said, you know, there are enough stadiums in Kenya, and especially in Nairobi at the time. What Wh Kenyans need... Which was not accurate and not accurate yeah. even now. Yeah. What Kenyans need, what Kenyans need is an improvement of roads. Because our infrastructure under the previous administration had become very dilapidated. And I think you recall there was people who were called cowboy contractors. Now, we managed to get a grant, in other words, a gift to the Kenyan people of $150 million. That did the road from the airport all the way to Gigiri. That road was a game changer. That road previously, that's all through Uhuru Highway. That, game, that road previously was, any time you had a bit of rain, there would be a pothole within a year. We changed the game. 206, that road was ready. And up to date, until now when there's been some construction on it, there's never been a pothole. Very little maintenance on that road. We changed the game, and it was a gift. Cowboy contractors, you talk about cowboy contractors, and that those who use that title, 
on you because they say you had privileged access to single-sourced kind of transactions with the government. I've just given you an example. That was not single-sourced. It was an open tender. It was even internationally financed, primarily by ADB at the time. And I can tell you, what, 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 why can one not bid? I was an agent. We bid and won competitively. So I don't know, unless you have something specific, please pin me to something specific. Because cowboy contractors, the way we looked at cowboy contractors was where they fly by night contractors. They would come in, do a shoddy job and run away. That was the term. I'm still here in Kenya. Cowboy contractors, businessmen, and other matters coming up after this break. Coming up, money, influence, and power. We unveil politician come businessman Jimmy Wanjigi. Live from Muthaiga, the home of businessman Jimmy Wanjigi. And Jimmy, before we took the break, we were talking about thicker highway. Yes. And again, you speak of it, again, like a good guy. With a lot of passion. But I'll tell the, you why. The bottom line is money, isn't it? Oh, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I'm so passionate about the road. It was game-changing for the economy of Kenya. That was what you call the right policies. That road was the most densely populated road in Kenya. But I'll tell you the real value of closing markets. And that's what roads do. They stimulate during and after. The land value before thicker road was built along the road was 500 million shillings maximum. Average about it, It's a beautiful project. No, 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 it's just, a beautiful project. Let, no, let no, me be clear. No, no, let no, me be no, clear. Jimmy. I think don't, don't cut me because this dovetails with what I was talking about policy. 500, 300 million. Today, that land is 110 million shillings. It changed the economy and lives of people exponentially. So when you come to policy, I wanted to do the same thing if at least this government to do the same thing with Mombasa Road. Because that would have exponentially changed the livelihoods of communities entire length and breadth of Mombasa Road. From the Waswahili, to Taita, to Kambani, to Kikuyu's here, to Kalenjins, to Masai's, to Luya's, to Kisi's, to Lowe's. It would have changed the economy during construction and after. So would you like these to These are the policies, these fine. are the policies that I have issues with and I had issues with, with this government. That's fine, Jimmy. And tonight, one of the big questions out there is the source of your wealth which is why we are asking these questions. And from the conversation we've had so far, the last time you did something sort of private was garbage collection. The rest, is the rest of your money coming from government projects? Government projects inside and outside Kenya. Inside and outside Kenya. I'm an agent of various companies. And development projects are the biggest projects in Africa, even in Kenya. Government today is 70% of the economy of this country. Who would not want to do business or have an inclination to touching business with government? If you're a businessman, you would. But not just here. Many other countries on this continent. Is that the reason you took an interest in influencing elections, if I could use that words, those words, because in 2013 you were associated with Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto. 2017 you switched sides mm -hmm. to support Raila Odinga. And in both campaigns, 
you have been described as a financier of those elections. Well, I think you better ask those who describe me as that. Um, I aid in my, in, my, in my small way, like every other Kenyan, financially. But I think if you really discuss with the people I've assisted, they'll tell you it's more than money. More than money. It is strategy. As I keep telling you, I'm a businessman. I know how to solve problems. I'm able to put pieces together to find solutions. That is why. I supported Raila Odinga because I had fallen out with the policies of the Urutu government, completely. And I said after they were away from the ICC cases in 2015, I was going to do my best, my best, to get them out of power. And I called my friend and I said I have a path. And I think we went very, very far. Very, very far. Strategically, we went very, very far. You know, you're describing it as policy, but at a basic level, one would say you are just upset with them that they took away the SGR project from you. No, 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 no. no. I'm a businessman. Once you have a government that's got the wrong policies, <laughs> Linus, today, is there a businessman that is happy? Is there a Kenyan, whether this the smallest business to the highest business that is happy, they are not happy. Because there have been some policies here that have taken us down. I'll you give you an example. I'll give you an example. Because I think this is graphic. When Kibaki left power, of every 100 shillings of Kenya revenue collections, 18 shillings went to debt. 18. Today, it is 75. Who is that debt? These are government thereafter that needs to find money, 30 shillings for the counties. It needs to find another 50 shillings for salaries, another 30 shillings for OPEX. It is borrowing just to feed itself. And who suffers? You and I are the government, we are the sovereign. We suffer. But so the minute you are seeing policies yeah. that are anti-business, because those policies are anti-business. Just like anywhere in the world, people vote on the basis of that. Look at America. There are those who are wealthy, who vote the Republican government, primarily because they know the wealth tax will not be much. We'll talk politics in a short while, Jimmy, but it's okay to be upset, isn't it? When under the Kibaki administration, you are the big name in all projects related to the thicker highway, um, the Southern Bypass, and also the uh, Jomo Kenyatta International Airport yes, uh, Greenfields up upgrade. And Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto come in and say, you know, this access will not happen this time. No, that's okay. That's okay. That is perfectly okay. They can choose the people that they want to do business with. I was not upset about that. I wasn't. In fact, I want to tell you something. That in 2015, early 2015, the two of them approached me, approached me to ask me to take whatever business I want. And I told them I want nothing. Not one project do I want. Not even the SGR? No. In 2015, I'm telling you, after acrimony in 2014, they approached me, both of them. And I said, I don't want one business. So please, that is not the issue. Would you like to talk to us a bit more about the acrimony you referred to in 2014? The acrimony was about policy, including SGR. And policy that I could see with this huge accumulation of debt that we're going to have problems with. I was one of those that voiced my concern about Eurobond directly, that we cannot go and borrow that sort of money for consumption from outside Kenya to that volume. So I can assure you, it was policy. I could see the kind of policies they were adopting were not in line with their manifesto, which I helped put together. And they were going to impoverish all of us. So I was very clear, very, very clear. I'm a businessman. 
A businessman wants policies that are value addition. But I, I will cross check you on, in a moment on the debt question because 2014 sounds to me like that was only the first year because they came in office in 2013. But that's when they started taking the debt. That's when SGR debt was taken. The repayments came later, but interest was to be paid. That's when Eurobond was done. Three billion dollars was done in 2014. Although all you're facing about debt was accumulated in the first term of this regime, not the second, the first term. Right, and it changed sides in 2017. If you're talking of policy, what was that that was different in Raila Odinga that you, you thought he would do differently from Jubilee? Raila Odinga has a track record. And the track record, even in government, was as prime minister in a coalition government with Kibaki. If you look at the growth patterns, the Kibaki period was phenomenal. We went from a negative one of Moi to 2007 to a 7% growth rate. We went down in 2008 because of clashes, but because of the coalition government and peace and the collaboration of the two of them in government, the economy started rising again. But would it be it accurate to, to say, beyond, would it be accurate to say, uh, Mr. Njigi, that you simply also wanted your place back, the place of privilege that you had under the Kibaki administration and you couldn't have under the Uhuru Kenyatta administration? I don't know what this place of privilege you are talking about is. Access to government projects? I No. Let me tell you, the greatest access, the greatest access is being able to talk to a leader. Not just about yourself, but about your environment. That I can tell you. That nobody denied me. I can assure you, because I am quite well vested in Kenya, that if the policies of the government are right, I will still grow like everybody else. We will all rise up. Our net worth, our values will all rise up. We'll be able to employ one more person, do one more thing, create one more idea. Because there are more and more people who are able. There's more and more baskets for everybody. So if the policies are right, as a businessman, I will benefit anyway, even without doing government business. So please understand me. It's policies. Policies and acrimony in 2014. In 2017, for three days, there was a siege in this home. The two, uh, that's the president and the deputy president, you brought together in 2013 the government that they formed was deployed to your home? I think that was a very sad and unfortunate situation. At the time, it caused a lot of agony to my family. All I did was exercise my democratic right. That's all. To choose somebody else to support. That is my democratic right, as it is for every Kenyan. I did it. And I did it with zeal. Maybe the same zeal that helped them also get to power. Why I became a victim and I was not even on the ballot, I don't know. Maybe you better ask them. But well, I want to tell you, yeah. I want to tell you something, Linus. As a family, we have forgiven that. Because in retrospect, I think and I believe he advertised, they advertised me to the world. They advertised me to the world. But in the process, they also told the world just how many guns you keep. So many. I mean, assault rifles. Should a businessman have what looks like a cachet of arms at home? <laughs> <laughs> Those were licensed weapons. Licensed by the government of Kenya. You know, there's a renewal process every year. I am not different to many other Kenyans who have got those licenses. I had licenses at the time for more than 20 something years. So really, I think uh, with one with the investments in quite a few places, I don't think that is too bad. Uh, wait, because I, I, did not, I, did not carry, I did not carry those weapons on me like some uh, on my bag. They must have been carried by others. Others who are probably protecting property and other things. So We're taking a break shortly. Do you, you. you like guns? Or? No, 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 I don't. I don't. I'm not a fan of guns at all. All right.
and we'll take a break on that note and we shall be back shortly. Coming up, money, influence and power. We unveil politician come businessman Jimmy Wanjigi. Once again, we're speaking to businessman Jimmy Wanjigi, who has just declared interest to run for president. Mr. Wanjigi, this is not a national prank, is it? No, not at all. It's very serious. You see, Linus, to run for president is an awesome decision. Awesome decision. It takes a lot of thought and a lot of self soul searching. It takes family. My entire family had to agree to this because it is sacrifice. It is very serious. I'm going for one seat and one seat only. The presidency of the Republic of Kenya. I'm not going for any other seat. The presidency, the Republic of Kenya. And I'm doing so in ODM. Because I'm very, very determined to anchor party democracy and internal party competition. I went to see the Secretary General of the party on Friday. And one of the things I said to them is that let's show the world and first Kenyans that we can actually have a democratic process within the party, that this party does not belong to any individual. It belongs to the nation of Kenya. And that that process should be very transparent to all, like we've seen recently in the race in America where even you get to the extent where you have debates of the candidates. I would love to debate whoever is a competitor in ODM, in a live platform, I will turn by you, within the party. And the one thing I know, it's probably only ODM that can do it. It's been there for 16 years. How, how realistic is this quest, considering that you've never sought elective office before? We do not know you for political skills. We, you're telling us a lot about business skills. We do not know you as a mobilizer. And you want to challenge Raila Odinga, who has been party leader since 2007, I think, and before that, and presidential candidate all that time. Yes. How realistic is this? Oh, very realistic. Everyone has their time and their season. Season is purpose. Raila Odinga. I agree with you, is formidable. One of the most formidable leaders and politicians we have known. But I can tell you my true belief is that he had his time and his season. He is a hero of the second liberation. That was a season we had in Kenya. That season had other heroes. Heroes like Ken Matiba. Heroes like Charles Rubia. Even my father. It's one of those heroes of that liberation. And that period was 30 years, as I'm explaining. 92 to 2022. And the, some, anchors, the anchors of that yes. season, I can tell you, is the 2010 Constitution. And something about those heroes is it takes time to make one. They don't just happen suddenly. You hardly three months, or is it four months, as a member of ODM, and you want to speak of yourself in the same term as those Matiba, Rubia? Yes. These are unusual times. These are not conventional times. The challenges we are facing today do not call for conventional solutions. We can't keep recycling the same people, the same method, and expect a different result. These are not conventional times. Whoever thought we would be in this state as a world or even Kenya. Who ever thought this calls for politics unusual, 
completely unusual, out of the box thinking. Every period has its Davids. Every period. The Davids of the second liberation are known. The Davids of the first liberation, Jomo Kenyatta, are known. I am standing up to be a David of the third liberation. The you've challenges. Moved, you've moved around facing. the country already. I've seen you uh, as recently as today in Nyeri uh, doing your political circuits. Can you sense any impressions of a David, uh, at least from the side of the voter? Do they think of you that way? Oh, yes. You know, it's very interesting. I, it's unfortunate that we can't campaign because of COVID uh, the way we have traditionally done. But slowly but surely, I believe the message is resonating. It's resonating. Because, you know, you say time. Your media have been perpetrating some candidates for the last three years. Horses you've created. So now they make their own story. One. Media doesn't perpetrate well, the story. I, I don't, you, I, you make your own I, story. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. I believe if you really go down and ask many, many Kenyans, the choices you are perpetuating are not in their hearts. They believe, just like I do, that the people who've been there 30 years are not going to be the solution for the next 30 years of their lives. They do believe that. My friend Raila is probably the only hero amongst those who have said are candidates. But he has been there 30 years in government. Alonzo Musioka was elected in 1983. That is 38 years. My friend Musalia, 1989, 33 years. William Ruto, 1992. They'll, they'll tell years. you that is, that is long, those are long years of sub public service. There's nothing wrong. And what have it, we it, gotten it, for it? What have we gotten for it? Please tell me what we've gotten for it. Who is happy here? When this government took over, do you know what the poverty rate was? It was 36%. Today, it is 52%. That is what the result is. 52%. Now, you tell me, and they are all there, they are all there, that you expect them to give us another solution for the next 30 years. But, but, but surely that should not be the only reason you should run for president, the fact that they have been there for long. No, give your own reasons. It's not the only reason. It's definitely not the only reason. It's that I am fresh. I'm coming in with a wealth of experience in business. And as I told you before, business is about solutions. Finding solutions, solving problems. And I have that experience. This is a time for business. It's a time for economic revolution. It's a time for solving problems that are very basic. That anchor to our campaign is Article 43, economic and social rights. That anchor means literally lifting GDP. Because to attain that, we have to lift GDP to 7 to 10%. Let's not talk about GDP. Talk to a very simple issue here the unemployment rate in this country. Just as an example, yes. Kenyans would want to know from anybody who wants to go to that high office what they intend to do ab about that. Oh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. And, you know, I hope people don't start stealing ideas. I hope that we don't start talking here and people steal ideas. I'll tell you. Kenya needs to brand itself. We need to configure our brand. My own personal view, and that of the view of my team, is that we need to key three premium products and say this is the brand called Kenya. Our labor has an amazing brand. In the entire Africa, our human resource is known for aptitude, is known for hard work and ethics. 
I'll give you an example of Philippines. I'm still waiting to hear. Yes, I'm how, going to tell you. How you intend to... I will to give you an example of Philippines. Philippines, in the 80s, had a very big problem with labor. An expanding population, young people, on an island. And they did something very unique. They, they entered into labor agreements. Labor agreements as a government with the nations that had vacancies, huge vacancies. But there were labor agreements, labor contract agreements. Where they said, we shall train, if you have a shortage, for example, drivers. We shall train engineers. And we shall send them to fill your gap. I think the Filipinos are one of the biggest exporting labor markets. But Isitoshi, the agreement was very deep. It meant discipline. It meant value addition. And it meant after a period, those people came back with trained skills that they added to their country. They were never there for long. That has worked. Today, a simple thing like that, a simple thing like that is done by some private bureaus. And literally what those bureaus are doing are taking slave labor out of here. It is pathetic. Pathetic. I'll give you more. There is something called manufacturing. Contract manufacturing helped China. China today is the biggest contract manufacturer. It manufactures products for many other nations. No economy is going to grow to a second or third world or first world if it does not do manufacturing. South Korea and Kenya were at par. Let me just give you, just be patient. We're at par. Now, Jimmy, you want to run for president of no, Kenya? No, no, no. Just, just hold on. We're at par yeah. in the we, 70s. We've, do, we've done Philippines, China, what they did, South Korea. What they did. Can we do Kenya? Yes, now? I'm doing yes. Kenya. Yes. What they did is they brought business into the equation. Glasgow was the biggest ship manufacturer in the world. Glasgow. And what did they do? They said, we can do shipbuilding in South Korea at a much cheaper price, much shorter. Set up naval academies that taught their people. Today, most of the ships in the world are built there. That was the base of industrialization, base of manufacturing. We can do that in Kenya. Let me go further. And I'll give you an even simpler one, which is very, very unfortunate. Livestock. Livestock today is 4% of our agricultural GDP. Livestock. 4%. Mm. And let me bit, tell you why. Let me we, tell we have you. a bit more to cover with very, very Just, just one time. quick one. One quick one. 4% of, 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 of agricultural GDP. That 4% employs a few hundred thousand people. Now, our value is low simply because of one thing. When you kill an animal for its, not livestock, uh, for its hides and skins, the hides and skins, hides and skins of a stressed animal get very stressed. So that primary becomes a primary product. Its value is very low. Ethiopia here, let me give you an example, does not kill crudely. It kills with gas. And if you check the premium on that simple product called hides and skins, for Ethiopia, it is three times the value. Imagine how many more people would be employed. What I'm trying to say is this. If you adopt a business approach to this enterprise called Kenya, business is the biggest employer. That's what I'm trying to tell you. OK. I want us to come now to your uh, personal philosophies. And I want us to start with making wealth. What is your philosophy on making wealth? My philosophy? Well, let me say I'm a law-abiding Kenyan who believes in the Constitution. And the Constitution is very clear about making wealth because it describes it in the economic part. We are a mixed economy. Mixed. That is our description as a country. And mixed economy has a market economy, it has a command economy, and it has a very basic traditional economy. 
I am for anybody and support anything that is in line with those three economies. But here is our reality, and I would like to hear your views. Corruption creates a lot of wealthy persons. Whether we're talking of the national government or county governments, people are becoming rich because of corruption. There is also among the youth the desire to make money really quickly and to the point of doing illegal things like money laundering. What is your stance on corruption? Rule of law. Rule of law. My administration, I can assure you, will be very strict on the rule of law, the adherence of the rule of law. That's all that you is the problem here. Address a bit the very thin line in the Kenyan context between business and corruption. When you talk of Anglo leasing, it sounds like business. It can't be justified as business. No, I, th I think Anglo leasing with its push at the time was a lot more than just um, what you're saying. I think there were You can go factors. as far back. Golden Bug as there well. Were, there were very many factors to that. But I'm saying, let us talk about the rule of law. That is the crux. For some strange reason, this government specifically, and you know, we percolate, has had a problem adhering to the rule of law. Now, if the government does not adhere to the rule of law, who will? When they came to this house, let me tell you, they were given court orders to walk out. They were served with them. Those court orders, because their court orders just said they are coming to search for items, they disobeyed. They said they are irrelevant. I experienced it. Many people experience it every day. We see it. It's a rule of law. But here is how rule of law works with regard to corruption in Kenya. The chicken thief will go to jail, but NYS, Anglo leasing, Goldenberg, nobody's in jail. Oh, it's more than that. Let me tell you. Family members of leaders are doing business with government. This is unethical. Unethical. No family member of mine would do business with the government. How? Where does that ever happen? Where does that ever happen? That is the extent. If you are doing it at the top, who will not do it at the bottom? So please, it is, it is really a matter of the rule of law, because the law is there. I would not even say we need to change the institutions, because we have all of them. We have structures, ESCC, we have asset recovery, we have so many things, CID. It's not that. It is strict adherence to the rule of law, and it starts with yourself as a leader, as a head of state. No family member, you yourself, will not participate in business. I am a businessman. I had no public office. I can participate in Biashara. But uh, once you take public office, you leave it. But you know, you can be, like you said, you describe yourself as an agent. So you can that be an still, agent of family members. No, that's what I'm saying. That's the strictness I'm talking about. I can be an agent when I'm outside. But once you take public office, it is about service, not enrichment. Not enrichment. And that's the tragedy of Kenya today. Our forefathers in the 60s were people who understood service. They loved the country. They were very patriotic. Kenya has not been the way you're seeing it. They did wonders. They worked day and night to ensure we had the foundation we have today. Nobody went for profit. My own father, for example, was the first director of settlement. Okay, He demarcated land all over this country. He never took one acre, one quarter for himself. He was happy seeing the empowerment of Kenyans who had suffered under the colonial regime. And I can tell you that was just is one man it was across the board. That is the Kenya we must get back. That is ethical. 
I talk to you about premium products. We must define who we are. And you're talking of things of really high ideals, but um, uh, Mr. Wanjigi, it's hard to be many years after you, your relationship with the Uhuru administration broke down, your uh, relationship with Raila Odinga also, we assume, is broken down. Why didn't you speak out earlier? Corruption is not new in Kenya. Let, let, me, let me give you a tip. Um, corruption, we have talked about. I can assure you, a lot of the corruption that has been voiced about this current regime, we had something to do with it. We made sure it was in public domain. I have not, to correct you, fallen out with Raila Odinga. We, why would we fall out? We are competing, we are friends. We are competing for a seat. This is how, it's my democracy, it's his democracy. I don't even know whether he's standing, he has not declared. But really, why would we fall out? Because I'm exercising my democratic right to stand. We can't fall out because of that. Well, there are all indications that he's running for president. He was oh, well, let him today. announce. Let him announce. And if he announces, he's going to find me there competing with him. He's going to find me there. And I'm competing for only one seat, the presidency of the Republic of Kenya, the presidency of ODM, nothing else. So I please, we have voiced corruption. We have brought out probably a lot of the stink you have seen of the last few years. And we are quite proud because... The fact that we did has made Kenyans very aware. I think even the president has now gotten up and admitted over the last few years to the extent of even saying two billion is lost per day out of corruption. Before he used to deny. He used to say we are busy making noise. He wishes that we would leave him alone to develop the country. So we are very happy that he's now come our way and listened to the cries we used to have there's a second part of my question on corruption and wealth that I asked and I'd wait for your answer on what we see with the youth. Get rich quick. It's a Kenyan mentality now. And they say, you know, look at Jimmy Wanjigi. Look but at I, the likes of Jimmy Wanjigi. He's I got did, a helicopter. He's got a home. That but I did not get rich quickly. That is a fallacy. I was trying to explain to you my story of garbage collection. And how I even found a solution to get a schoolmate of mine. Fortunately, I went to school with some Mazungus here. Because I couldn't get deposits from liners so that I could buy a pickup. I had to find a Mzungu schoolmate who went around getting deposits from people because a Mzungu was viewed as credible and Jimmy was not. And those deposits bought us our first pickup. A schoolmate of mine called David. Goody fellow. That is how I began. And within a year, I can tell you, of that pickup, we were able to have three trucks and two canters. By the second year, we had even gone further. We pioneered. I still see bins is still around. I sold it many, many years ago at that time. But I can tell you, it did not start like people envisage. They should come and ask us, but what has happened, it's not Jimmy that they are seeing. It's people that they know, that they live with, that for some reason or another, get into contact with some contract of government. And they see their life changing overnight. That is not business. That is wheezy. That is theft, my friend. And theft is against the law. That's why I'm talking about the rule of law. And let me add, some of this theft, when you steal, for example, in hospitals, that is death to people, death to human beings. And yet, there's no capital punishment for this corruption. No more. We are not going to allow this anymore. But I want to get to my final set of questions because we are running uh, out of time, uh, uh, Mr. Wanjigi. And they'll be in form of very quick questions. The first one is, did you ever threaten John Gidongo, the whistleblower of anglo -Lising? No. Not at all. I'm a law-abiding citizen. Why would I threaten anybody? Never. 
I've never done that. Okay. My next question, did you know Jacob Juma and what was your relationship with the late Jacob Juma? Jacob Juma was a friend. I knew him. Jacob Juma brought to me a very interesting analysis of the budget books in 2014. And that was about Eurobond. He had a very interesting submission. The government said he's borrowing 300 billion domestically. And it had borrowed Eurobond 300 billion. So that 300 billion sovereign Eurobond was supposed to be the domestic borrowing. And in December of 2014, it had not been regularized in the books. So it was showing that even though the government borrowed 300 billion from sovereign Eurobond, in the books, they had also still borrowed domestically from our domestic banks. That was how the Eurobond saga became loud. Because it seemed like there was a double borrowing. And this one was not accounted for in the books. That is what Jacob Juma brought to me. That is how the Eurobond issue that we talk about came out. And I think up until today, and this is where now some of you media, it is very sad that you have not interrogated this. The Auditor General never completed that report on a missing $1 billion. Never completed it. And you have never interrogated it. $1 billion is 100 billion Kenya shillings. That seems to have disappeared. And you have never interrogated it to date. Why? Why? It goes into the back pages. He was the whistleblower of Eurobond. And my friend. And okay. very unfortunate that he died. A young man. And left two children. Very painful. 2013 presidential elections. Did you operate an independent tiling center for Jubilee? Yes, I, I, we had a command center that was a tiling center and I operated it, yes. That is correct. But that independent tiling center, every party does so. Every candidate does so. And that tally center gets returns from your agents as to the results. And yes, I ran, I, I, I ran it, yes. And I think very successfully. Was the tally center decisive in the 50 plus one result that was eventually declared? Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, don't listen to the rumors. Uhuru won that election. Did you not see the difference of votes? It was 800,000 votes difference. He won that election. I believe the competitors went to court. And what happened? They lost. Did you similarly have an independent tallying center and electronic tallying center, I mean, in 2017 for Ilo Odinga? Yes. We had one here and we had one outside of Kenya. This time it was anchored very differently because, you know, the law had been changed. The polling station of the president under the law became the constituency. And you had the results that could only be transmitted electronically. So it was a lot of work. And yes, we, I ran that center. In closing, why are you always interested in who becomes president? Because I'm a unifier. Look at NASA. You're talking about NASA. Look at all the people that came together in NASA. Unification means peace and prosperity. Business and prosperity thrive in unification when the country is together. I have skills that are able to do this. Why not lend my skills for the greater good of this wonderful country that has given us so much? And that good includes your business? Absolutely. And everybody else's. And our health. We are blessed. This is a wonderful country. Mr. Jimmy Wanjigi, we have to end it here. Thank you very much for talking to us. Jimmy Wanjigi speaking to us live from his home in Muthaiga. We have to end it here. Back to you, Victoria and...